Pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Matthew, for joining us. Um, a few words about uh, us. Um, Kumra Capital is a late stage or growth capital uh, investor out of Israel. Uh, but I think, interestingly, most of our portfolio companies are today headquartered in New York. So even though we're Israeli investors and we are focused on Israeli tech companies, uh, we actually spend a lot of our time here, both in terms of the companies that we are within the portfolio and in terms of deal flow of Israeli companies, which are already very active and, and domiciled here. So we wanted to take a bit of a break from tech and cyber and uh, intelligence and talk a little about what does it mean to bridge this uh, cultural business gap between uh, Tel Aviv and New York? And even though Tel Aviv and New York seem to be close communities, there are still a lot of challenges when, uh, when moving uh, offices from Tel Aviv to New York. So I'd like to present in a few words, uh, Matthew. So Matthew Brontman is, first of all, a close friend. He's a New York-based businessman, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. Uh, he's one of the most active Jewish-American investors in the Israeli economy, currently owning IKEA in Israel, and previously major owner of Israel Discount Bank, Shufer Sal, among other investments. Among his nonprofit activities, he's chairman of the steering committee of Limud FSU, a program focused on strengthening the Jewish identities of Russian Jews, He's chairman of the Board of Trustees of the AGC and chairman emeritus of AGC Jerusalem. AGC is the world's leading Jewish advocacy organization. Matthew is married to an Israeli, father of eight, and spends a growing amount of his time in Tel Aviv. So Matthew, your family has always been very involved with Israel, both in business and philanthropy. When did you start getting personally involved with Israel and business in Israel? Uh, <clears throat> My, first of all, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Harris, for asking me uh, to this conference. Um, so I, st I started uh, really investing in Israel at the height of the uh, Second Intifada in 2002, 2003. Great timing. Uh, well, it, yes, people thought I was stark raving mad. Uh, but in fact, it was good timing. Um, it was, but it, it, was not, it was not done. Uh, based on, you know, think, thinking that things were terrible and that things would get better. I did think they would get better, but it, it, was, um, it was a little bit of a struggle to figure out how to bridge the cultural divide uh, between, between America and, and, you know, I grew up in a family that had always done a lot of philanthropy in, in Israel, but my, my dad uh, had a philosophy which was basically, in those days, you know, we're talking about really the 80s and 90s, before we started, which was you give money to Israel, you don't invest in Israel. Uh, and I had a little different philosophy, which was that Israel is going to grow up and Israel is going to be sustainable, and therefore you need to switch from being sort of only philanthropy to also investing in a growing economy. And so we really started in, in 2003 was when we made our first investment in, uh, in uh, what was called the Blue Square, Rabua Kahol, mm -hmm. which was then the second largest supermarket chain. Obviously, lots happened in that industry in, uh, over, over the last 16, 17 years. Yes. So tell us a little about the differences between doing business in the US and doing business in Israel. First of all, I think most businesses are local. Um, and so you have to understand the local culture and, and the local landscape. Um, and so things, things are different. You know, one of the things in, was sort of a cultural shock for me, which you all will understand, is that in Israel, when uh, when I would sort of give a suggestion to one of, one of our, the guys working for us, they would basically tell me I'm an idiot. Um, they, would, they would be very aggressive in their, in their communication mm -hmm. of, of their opinions. In America, the people are a lot more polite. At least that's been my experience. They may disagree with you. They will tell you gently. They will not confront you. Having said that, at the end of the day, I found anyway that, the, that the, once a decision is made, the people in Israel are really soldiers. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll fight, they'll argue with you, but once a decision is made, they'll implement it. Here, there's a little more politics, backstabbing, they don't necessarily implement it, they come up with excuses. So sort of the confrontation is more out there, mm -hmm. and I find that refreshing. But it did take a while for me to sort of get used to, the, uh, to, get used to that kind of aggressiveness in the, in the conversation. 
but by now I think that you've become a, a half Israeli. And <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I think so. The, when you look at Israeli businesses that you invest in, yeah. do you have some kind of an emotional discount when looking at these businesses? I mean, do you measure them differently than your business here in the U.S.? That's, that's a great question. And, and certainly when we, when we invested in Discount Bank, um, people asked me that a lot. And, and, and the answer was really twofold. First, first of all, had there been a, an auction of a bank in Greece or Turkey or Bulgaria, uh, we would not have looked at it. Right. That does not mean that our economic considerations were different. But there's clearly an emotional tie to, to Israel and doing business in Israel and with Israelis and trying to support the economy. Um, but that doesn't mean, again, we want to take a discount on, uh, on our return expectations. Uh, so, so, it's, so it's a little bit of yes and a little bit of no. Mm -hmm. I hate to be a lawyer on that. So, you know, on one hand, yes. But, uh, so, but I, I think that there is, as much as we, you know, what they say about England, two nations uh, separated by common language. So as much as there is a commonality of purpose and identity of being Jewish and, and caring about certain things, there, so there is a tie to want to do business in Israel, but uh, there's no reason to take a, an economic mm -hmm. hit for that. Yeah, so maybe the initial motivation of getting Correct. there is... Correct, and looking at, the, looking at it and, and, and being able to... to Feel you know I feel very very much at home in Israel, uh, not just because I have an Israeli wife. I've I've felt comfortable there since my first visit uh, many many years ago. So you you invested in banking and in retail in Israel and areas which have a lot of government involvement and mm -hmm. regulation in, involved. How was the communication with the Israeli regulators as opposed to you know, the U.S. regulators that you work with? Um, so we haven't done a lot of, of uh, investing in, in regulated, well, I, I haven't done a lot of investing in, in regulated businesses in America. <clears throat> of course, my family, which comes from the beverage alcohol industry, it's a very regulated business. But I never, I never worked for the Seagram company. Um, I can tell you that when we were looking at the investment in the bank, I said to my family that they were very concerned about uh, the, the, uh, the potential for bad loans. And obviously, there's a huge book of reserves, and, and what, would those, what would happen to those reserves over the, the ensuing few years? And I, and I said uh, to my family, do not worry about the bad debts. I said they may be off by a little bit, but frankly, the Bank of Israel is so in their underwear, frankly, that it's not going to be an issue. I said, you have two, two real things to worry about. One is the unions. And one are the regulators and changing regulations. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, that proved to be very prophetic because uh, you know Discount Bank had the, the toughest union in Israel, and, it, and it's, uh, we were never able to really do anything about it. And the regulations never stopped coming. The regulators were very, very aggressive, which of course was also uh, only amplified by the financial crisis. We bought, we made our investment prior to the financial crisis. Not very good timing. Um, and, and the amplification of the regulations, the increase in capital adequacy requirements, et cetera, uh, made it very difficult. And, and I would tell you today that I don't think we would invest in another regulated business uh, in Israel. It's, the regulators are, and, and, I, and I get where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got a view of really protecting the, the citizens of Israel and not being taken advantage of. Um, I do think, however, that you know, when, we, when we bought the bank, uh, today's re-elected prime minister was the finance minister. And we spent a fair amount of time uh, talking to him during the process. And, and he told me, listen, we really want a third strong bank uh, to compete with, with Leumi and, and Polim. So once you buy discount, you know, go and buy one of the other banks and merge them together. Uh, and so we, we went to them with two alternatives. And we were turned down both times mm -hmm. by the regulators saying that, no, actually having five, six banks is better than having a third com large competitor. So, I'm not saying we were duped, uh, but as finance minister, there was one thing, and then the baton was passed to the Bank of Israel, and, and the governor uh, and the governor's staff did not think that uh, a merger between Discount and any of the other banks was something that they were going to approve. So. You know, we've been very accustomed for many years to have U.S. investors in Israel and mm -hmm. U.S. companies which are establishing offices in Israel and so on. 
In the last decade, there has been hundreds of Israeli tech companies that established offices here in New York and actually provided jobs in the city and so on. Is the business relationship becoming more bilateral? Do you feel it in your businesses as well? I think it's absolutely becoming more bilateral. Uh, and I think it's, it's a phenomenal thing. I wish, you know, as we're seeing companies stay private longer, I think that's a great thing. I, I, you know, we don't, you know, for IKEA, which is really the business we have, you know, first of all, Discount Pack, of course, that had a big presence here. I apologize to you, but at least when we were there, Discount was the largest presence in, in, uh, in New York uh, and South America. Um, so you already had that bilateral. IKEA is completely separate in terms of its franchise versus its, its corporate owner. They own the, it's corporately owned here in America. Um, but, I, but I love the fact that Israeli companies have grown up to the point where they can be here. Um, and you see, I mean, it was mentioned a, a minute ago how not just Americans, but you know, Chinese and everybody's coming to Israel for their technology. I mean, Israel is a completely different, in a very different place than it was uh, close to 20 years ago when I started investing there. And I think it's phenomenal. Um, as a Zionist, uh, my one wish is that not so many Israelis would permanently leave and move to Silicon Valley or LA or, or New York, that it would be more temporary because uh, we, need, we need to strengthen the state of Israel even more. Uh, but that's a, a separate issue, not something that was really part of the question. Uh, but no, I think it's, it's amazing uh, the technology that's come out of Israel and the amount of, of jobs that have been created here uh, by Israeli companies and, and Israeli technologies. Um, and you would not have predicted that 20 years ago. So just the last question before we end this, we are out of time. There is a very thriving Jewish community in New York, and you're very active in the Jewish community here. And there is a very uh, fast-growing Israeli tech community in New York. There is very little contact between them. Okay? I think definitely not formal, but not even in the informal levels. I don't see these two communities uh, uh, communicating a lot. Do you have any ideas of how to strengthen these uh, bridges between these two communities? Well, I think conferences like this are, are a good start. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> thank so, you, so, thank you, Calculist. Uh, it's, I, you know, we were actually at dinner last night, we were kind of discussing uh, tangentially that when Israelis are here and here for a while and then they put their kids in school, you start to then integrate because of, of, of that. Um, just with the Israeli parents meeting, the American parents were sending their kids, hopefully your kids go to Ramaz or Heschel or one of the Jewish day schools, uh, and then they really, they really integrate. I think that um, it's, it's hard. It's hard. I can tell you that for, for my wife, having her Israeli posse of friends was life-saving for her. Um, and and it's, it is a challenge. We see it. You, know, I, you mentioned I do a lot of work with the Russian-speaking Jewish communities around the world. And one of the reasons we do that is because even after all these years of, of Russians being in America, there's still a separation between the Russian community, and it's all over the world. It's in, even in Israel, you know, the Russians are s separate, and we find it all over, which is why we do these conferences to try to instill Jewish values in, in the Russians who may not have it. But that really should be the local communities, the Federation's job. Um, and I know that the Federations here work on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it is hard. There is that cultural divide, and, and uh, I think it's something, it is a challenge, but something that we need to work on. Great. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you.